Hi everyone and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Flynn Tracy and I'm joined by Alwyn Hunt. Alwyn, how are you going? Good, good, good. It's fresh down here in Adelaide this morning, so um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a chilly start to the morning. Yeah, we were sharing stories about getting fr frost off windows and everything today. So yeah, it's a bit chilly in Sydney as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people think Australia is always tropical, but uh, you know, it, we're in the middle of winter and it does get cool here. That's exactly right. So yeah, thanks for getting up early with us. Really excited about this series. Before we get stuck in, I wanted to give a shout out to everyone in chat. Hey, Sam, that was an awesome stream just before. Um, and Michelle Roberts, Quinn, good to see you there. D, lovely to see you. Hope you've been okay. It's been a while now. RB is in the house. That's awesome. Johanna is in the chat looking after us, um, which is fantastic. So it's great to see you there, Johanna, as well. Um, so yeah, we're really excited. So this is the beginning of a series. We've done a couple of these before where uh, we have a couple of series in a row. And we want to we want to we want to have somewhere to start for those of us who don't know anything about 3D. We can start at the very the very basic kind of level, and we can build up our skills over time. Um, and I'm very excited that Alan, you have agreed to come along and help us on this journey. And this is great for me as well because I know very little about 3D. So you're just going to teach me how to be an amazing 3D designer in like four weeks. Are you paying for this course? <laughs> yeah. I should be. I should be for sure. Um, so yeah. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about about yourself um, and how how you got into 3D and what you're doing, what you do now. Yeah, no problem. Let me just jump over to this one. Um, yeah. So so my background, like we talked about, is you know I came from a background of visual effects where I spent you know a good part of of sort of 20 years. Um, and I'm just going to kind of I'll quickly go through. I've got a bit of a slide deck. I don't want to spend too long on it. I really just want to, you know, brush through this so we can get into the, the meat of the, um, the series and, and talk about, you know, getting into 3D. So um, I currently work as a sales business development in the recently formed 3 and i division of Adobe. So with the acquisition of Substance earlier, uh, Earlier in the year, um, I come across to Adobe, so I've been working um, with Adobe now for almost a year. Um, like I said, my background's in visual effects. Uh, I worked, you know, in a number of studios around the world, uh, and I've got a bit of a timeline. And it sort of started, you know, when I left uh, New Zealand. You know, from I actually didn't fall into this industry. I actually studied as a chef for almost, uh, you know, I studied did an apprenticeship oh, wow. for three years. Yeah, I did an apprenticeship for three years and actually worked in that industry for almost eight years. Um, and that took me overseas to London where I was working in, you know, Michelin star restaurants and, and you know, working with the likes of Gordon Ramsay and Marco Keir White, et cetera. So I worked at a really high level. So CG wasn't really even on the, on you know, a career pathway back in the days when I left school. So, um, but when I came back from overseas, I used my food art to get into art school because it was always about the creative and I actually specialised as a pastry chef and used to do a lot of food sculptures and chocolate sculptures and, and the likes and that was, you know, I had enough food art to uh, qualify me to get in and study fine art. So um, again, I wasn't even thinking about computer graphics or 3D or CGI or anything, it still wasn't even on the radar. Um, but while during my time while I was studying fine arts, I got into photography and photo manipulation and they were the sort of early days of Photoshop actually. Um, and so I started getting more into that world and that was when the sort of the computer computer art was kicking in and I seen, you know, courses for 3D. And these were the early courses that were being offered in Sydney. And um, so I seen that and I kind of automatically fell in love. I was like, well, that is amazing. <clears throat> and I knew that I wanted to get into to computer graphics and 3D. So I w again, I went off and studied for a couple of years and at the end of it, you know, I managed to get enough of a portfolio to, to get my first job in a small post-production studio in North Sydney. So once you've got your sort of first gig, then you're, you know, you're sort of off and running. Um, I managed to get into Animal Logic in Sydney and I was working as a generalist. Um, and then after that, I just traveled. So I went back overseas to Canada worked over there for a couple of years and then moved to London. And that was sort of the start of the whole 3D industry in the UK when the Harry Potters were being made and the Narnias, et cetera. So that's kind of when I was there. It was a, a golden period. Uh, uh, and that was Weta, Weta Digital, is that right? No, that was moving a company called Moving Picture Company. So that right. company, they, you know, re recently they did like the Jungle Book, the Lion King, 
they do <clears throat> do all the you know big blockbuster movies um, and they do amazing work. So I worked um, there for a couple of years on Narnia and um, a couple of other projects, and then. From there, I moved across to LA. I had an opportunity to bounce across there and work on Alice in Wonderland. That was Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. And we'll see more of this stuff on my demo reel in a minute. And then I went back to London and worked on a project which I'd heard about years beforehand, which was called John Carter. And um, it didn't do that well at the box office, but it was a really fun project just because of the nature of the characters. Um, and then I went to Weta, uh after that to work on The Hobbit. So, um, like I said, I'm, I specialised as a character texture artist, and I will talk more about these job roles within the 3D uh, as we get through this. But yeah, I specialised as a character texture artist, um, and I got to work on Schmorg the Dragon. There was a team of four of us, incredibly talented team, um, that uh, worked on that dragon for a couple of years, you know, during the whole trilogy, during the ageing process of them. Um, and it was it was a lot of fun. And um, more recently, I was working down here in Adelaide at a company called Rising Sun Pictures. Um, and I've worked on things like Thor Ragnarok, you know, Game of Thrones and Tomb Raider, lots of cool projects. And it's a really cool little studio down here, actually. Mm. Um, so, yeah, if you want to play my demo reel from your side there, Flynn, that would be great. We can just see, I can talk through this as well, just to talk about exactly what I worked on. So, <laughs> Go. All right, audio is down. Yeah. So during my time at Weta Digital, and these guys, you know, they did Lord of the Rings and all, you know, lots of, you know, Ten Ten, and they've done lots and lots of films. Um, but during my time there, I got to work on some really cool characters. Again, an amazingly talented team, and these guys are based in New Zealand, uh, yeah. in Wellington. Um, during this process, you know, I was working on doing skin and for Iron Man, I was working on the suits, adding details like scratches and, you know, establishing the look of the medals. Um, you know, really my job is to take a 3D model and then make it sort of look realistic. During Wolverine, I worked on this character. We were, he went goes through this aging process from this old character to a young so this is a complete digital double and we'll talk more about that as well what a digital double is it's really replacing the actor with um computer generated imagery wow awesome. superman again i was working on digital double so you know with all the, the stunt scenes and some of the environment work you know um you have to replace all the stuff so these guys are digital doubles again um general zod superman uh, all the suits, everything is completely CG. And this is the John Carter project that I was talking about. I don't know if many people have actually seen this film, but I really enjoyed it. Um, but like you can see from the characters, just a lot of amazing character work that I got to work on, so that was fun. Alice in Wonderland, The Bandersnatch, Dodo Bird, again, just, uh, you know, and it takes, takes quite a lot of long time to specialise as a character texture artist. And, um, and you know, you just, you just don't start out being a character texture artist. You have to actually go through sort of certain stages to lead up to, to being a character texture artist. Uh, Wolverine, you know, the transformation. And then things like Robin Hood, which is the next one, which you'll see there's, you know, all the horses, all the people riding the horses. These are all the, the boat, everything's CG. All that stuff is CG, the boats out in the bay, all completely computer generated. And again, Narnia, so a lot of the characters are a really fun project to be on, a lot of animals. Again, this was at Moving Picture Company, so you can see that they've been working on animals for a long time. So when they actually got to work on Lion King and Jungle Book and all the rest of it, they were, you know, pretty pretty well versed in how to create animals. Yeah, it's incredible. So today, um, this is just a, you know, a quick snapshot of what the agenda is. I just want to talk briefly about what a production pipeline looks like. And this varies depending on which industry you're getting into. Um, it's not, you know, like it, it, it changes if you're going to be getting into sort of architectural visualization, or broadcast or whatever it may be, and I'll talk a little bit about that. 
Um, we've got 3D software, so I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of all the 3D programs out there. And, and today, what I really want people to be able to do is kind of walk away from this and go, oh, cool, I can just jump on a web-based app. I can start playing with some 3D and really just start exploring if it's the first time that you're thinking about getting into 3D. Um, and I'll talk more about the high-end software, which is, you know, the, the likes of the companies that I've worked for, the, the types of software that they use. Um, and then I'm going to jump into one of those 3D packages called Maya and, um, and just really just go back to basics with what is 3D modeling and, and talk about that. Um, and then the next stage in the pipeline, which is texturing and UVing, I'm going to talk about that, what these terms actually mean. We're going to talk, uh, go into a Q&A where you get to ask me a lot of tricky questions. And then I'll come back and do some texturing, um, which is the job that I spe specialized in with the 3D production pipeline. And then we'll come back for a QA. and a That's awesome. So, well, just yeah. as we're doing as we're doing that, yeah, I'll just, I'll just mention, um, guys, so that, that first Q&A timer is there, 32. That might be a bit ambitious. We've got a lot to go through, um, but we'll see if we can get there. Um, uh, Festus was asking in the chat, does Adobe now own Substance Software, Alwyn? It does. It does, it has done for about a year now, so fully integrated. Um, we talked about that offline, about whether it's part of the Creative Cloud. It's not yet. Um, the, you know, the plan is to, to, to bring it into Creative Cloud so people are able to use it. I mean, if you're a student now, you can go to substance3d.com and actually just download um, Substance and be able to use it for free. Um, and if you're, if you're not and you're a professional and you're wanting to trial it out, then there's a trial version of it there. So you can just go there now and, and download them. They've got a cool little launcher, which I'm, I'll show you what that looks like as we go through. Cool. Perfect. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, so yeah, let's just talk about the 3D production pipeline. I've got a cool image which outlines that. So really what we're looking at here is, is three main pillars. So if we look at this image, with the first the first sort of uh, pillar is pre-production. Um, and this is really when somebody's got a script or an idea and they're like, you know what, this could be really cool for a movie. Um, mm. So what needs to happen with that is that that story needs to get flushed out, put in front of people to make sure that there is a cool storyline there. And then if that kind of gets approved at that process, then it goes into storyboarding. And storyboarding is when they're actually, you know, you're doing images of, Potentially working out what the ang camera angles are looking like, what you know, how and how big these environments are look like. So it's the first sort of visual cue that you'll get of a story or a script. Um, and again, it's all in two D. It's just illustration stuff. It's really rough. It's again just trying to um, get a, a visual cue so people can look at it and go, actually, you know what? Uh, we need to have more focus on this hero character, whatever it is. The next step that we move into is animatic. Now, animatic is taking the 2D concept or storyboard and actually doing, starting that out in 3D. And this, again, it's really, really rough stuff. Mm. And I'm going to come back after, um, after today and, and talk more about these sort of departments and, and show what they look like as examples uh, later on. So from animatic, uh, if it gets approved at that place, at that, that, that stage, then it goes into the design phase. Now this is really if you're thinking about, hey, I want to be an illustrator or a concept design artist for you know visual effects or games or whatever it may be. This is the job that you'd be looking for. It's a really niche. It's a really cool job. A lot of people go for it. Um, and you, these these guys are kind of the rock star in the industries because they do all these amazing concepts. So again, they, um, they'll have, you know, they'll be given a bit of a brief and then they go away and then they, you know, do design concepts for characters, for environments, whatever it may be. These are the guys that are kind of really, try these are, these, are, these are the first stages of what the characters and environments will look like. And also setting the tone for the mood, you know, so through their concept art, they might be establishing colors and lighting and things like that. We're really, just, you're starting to get a feel for, for what it's gonna look like. Cool. Um, then we move into the second, uh, second stage, and this is production. So this is the area that I'm really gonna focus on today, and it's there's two main areas, and we're looking at sort of modeling and texturing. And these areas, um, and I, I specialized in my uh, career as a texture artist. So when we look at this, and like I said, this varies depending on what industry you're in. 
Um, if you're in a big studio like Pixar or ILM or DreamWorks or something like that, then they will have a, have a full blown production pipeline like this. But maybe you're thinking about, hey, you know what, I want to go work in an advertising company and or sort of a small commercial company or whatever it may be. Then one person will pretty much know all these different jobs. Right. So each one of these sort of um, naming groups here is is a specialty. Um, but we get a you know we get a, a job role which is called a generalist, and these generalists are incredible because they have uh, skills in all these different areas. So uh, yeah, when we look at production, so from that design phase, we move down into layout. Layout is taking that animatic and really just now you're starting to establish like camera angles um, and and how animation might start looking. Just it's really again really rough staging um, and you know just trying to really to just get a, a sense of of how things are being laid out. Uh, the next phase is R and D. So companies like Pixar and you know, ILM and all the and Weta Digital and all these big post production studios, each film that they start usually have some degree of difficulty with new technology. So you know, in the past, when we look at some films, they'll be you know they'll be really intense with sort of maybe storms or water effects, or you look at. Um, you know some of the Pixar ones, which are hair or fur. So this is all really complicated stuff for computers to work out. So they have a special department called R and D, research and development, where they'll go into this phase and basically look at this film and go, all right, this film, you know, say for example, it's cars. You know, like how are we going to deal with talking cars? You know, and things like that. So things will have to be worked out before they go into the next phase. So then we move into the modeling. So this is the 3D modeling. So I'm going to touch on that and just show you um, the basics of what the building blocks of 3D modeling are. Um, and at the same time, once the model's being built, you know, uh, after that you can go into rigging. So when we think of rigging, um, you got to think of me if I was, you know, actually modeled in 3D. Rigging is actually putting in the bones to a 3D character so that we can then animate it. So it's exactly the same as a as a human anatomy. It's really just you have anything that is modeled has to get rigged or has to get bones added to it so that then we can animate it. Mm. Um, and you can see there the next stage is animation, um, and we'll talk more about that. And that's that's a really a, a rare, very popular area for people to to start in when they're first thinking about getting into 3D is animation. They're kind of the, they're doing the performance. So they're bringing these three ca 3D characters to life and actually, you know, giving them emotion, bringing them to life. Um, it's it's a really cool job as well. Um, and then when you think about big films that have lots of smoke and dust and dirt and um, you know, buildings falling down. If you think of all the sort of you know Avengers films, like the very um, effects heavy. So that's a whole department within itself. So those guys are working, like I said, on smoke, dust, uh, you know, environmental, like rain, snow, whatever it may be. So it's kind of like there's a whole department that are dedicated towards just doing effects. Um, and then you've got the lighting department. Lighting are focusing, you know, and the, this lighting is very important to the whole production because they, you know, with through lighting you can be telling stories as well. So. Um, and, and just setting tones and, and, um, and the likes. And then once you've got all that, all those bits and pieces, you bring it all together and then you have to render it. Um, and I'm going to talk about how things are rendered. And they can, you know, if you've got all these elements with the environment, all the effects, everything's being animated, and you have to render that, it can take a lot of com uh, computers to be able to computate that and be able to render it, even a single frame. A single frame in a film can sometimes take uh, hours, if not days, wow. to, to render one single frame, um, just because it's so complex. And then we look at post-production. So compositing is taking everything sort of in production and bringing it all together in layers. And they they are the kind of the, the geniuses and they fix a lot of issues um, when it comes to post-production. Um, they take all these elements, layer it all up and then composite it all together to then kind of give us our final image, our final uh, render. Um, we have 2D, which are working on the credits and the, the sort of the front end and the back end of a film. So they'll be doing all the, all the credits and the, um, 
and then color correction. So if you think of films like Mad Max and how the color set was very saturated, this is going through a process called color grading. And that's really giving the final look of what the film is going to look like. You know, you go to the other extreme when you think of a film like Sin City and that very monochrome sort of look to Mad Max where it's very saturated colors. And that's all done within the, the sort of color correction or grading um, department. Yeah, wow. And then once you've been through all that, you get your final film that you get to see at the, at the cinema. So um, there's a lot of people, a lot of teams, you know, this can involve like hundreds of people just to get a film out. And, you know, like it, it's, um, it's very complex. Cool, awesome. Um, just one question. I know we've got a lot to go through, but I just can't, I can't not ask this question. But um, I, I know this is a pipeline. It's like a waterfall kind of approach to design. Is it, are, are all those things waiting on the previous one to, to kind of occur? Or are a lot of these things happening at the same time? Or how does that work like in, in the real world? Are the, you know, the people at the end, like grading and, and rendering eight, like eight different projects at once, or are they kind of working on the one at a time, then move on to the next one? How does that kind of work in the real world? Yeah, good question, Flynn. Yeah, it depends on the size of the studio, because, you know, look, when you think, when you look at some of the bigger studios, they'll be working on multiple projects at any one time. So um, from, you know, from me, from my experience of working in a, in, in a bigger studio, you know, I'll finish one you know one set of texturing for a project and then i'm straight into another one so there's always but then you look at the smaller size studios and maybe they are just working on the one um production so they'll just yeah. be focused on that um but when you look at this diagram for example you can see that once modeling's finished you know that model can then be taken straight across to rigging and then be you know worked on in the rigging department or the mm. model you know um, there's just you can you can be working and finishing a certain area and that can get fast forwarded to a, another department, right? So right. Um, there's, it's not sort of one after another. It, there is a little bit of a, a, a you know more of an organic flow when it comes to certain um, disciplines or jobs being finished. Cool, awesome. Um, but definitely when it gets to compositing and down here, then it's, it's a bit more of a linear workflow. Like they, you know, you have to finish compositing to move into the next phase. And, and to be honest, you know, if production stalls or something, there's problems at the front end of the pipeline, then it, it, then it just escalates. And by the time it gets to compositing, you know, these guys, sometimes they have literally weeks to get stuff done, you know, when, you know, they've been scheduled months you know what i mean so right. it, it can get really tight down this end of the pipeline and us yeah. you know so it's not always the most um you know stress-free environment down that end of the pipeline right um so now i just wanted to just start looking at modeling you know and this is one of the departments and i'll keep referring back to this image just so that people kind of know exactly where we're at so like i said i'm going to start in the modeling and i'm going to just go through some basics there um, and I'm going to talk about you know what you know what these these 3d models are made of like the you know called polygons and you'll hear this terminology like polygon poly mesh 3d primitives nerves and all this it's kind of jargon um, for a lot of people that aren't in the industry um, but I'm gonna you know this is the whole purpose is just to help explain what this is awesome That'd be great. Um, and just quickly before I jump into to Maya, I'm going to just, you know, just give a bit of a list to some of the, the, the 3D programs out there. So if we look on our left hand side, we've got programs like Maya, Houdini, 3D Max, Cinema 4D, you know, mm -hmm. Blender. These are all high end programs that are used in the big studios, gaming studios um, and, your, and your visual effects studios. You've got you know, um, a program like Blender, um, which is listed here as a free software as well. And that's, that's you know, you can go and download that today and be able to use it. It's got a, a huge community, a lot of online tutorials and content for people to be able to start out with and, and really start getting into it straight away. Um, a lot of these high-end softwares do have free versions of it, so you can, you know, start exploring it. My advice to people that are sort of first starting out is to sort of um, look at some of the web-based apps that are out there and just, you know, like I've got a couple here that I've listed and I've actually got them up on a browser, which I just wanted to, to quickly show you what that looks like. Um, and there's one, this one here, which is a cool one. Again, it's by Autodesk. Um, it's, it's called uh, Tinkercad. And, you know, you can come in here and basically just create a scene. I'm just going to open this one that I created earlier. 
Um, and what I love about this, it really just, it's, it's the, the, the fundamentals, but it helps you start working out like how to navigate in a 3D space. Um, and you can just, you know, just get your head wrapped around what it means to rotate and transform and, and move around in a 3D space. And you've got these basic building blocks that you can just start building on um, and just, you know, actually just having a little bit of fun with. And you can start learning the basic concepts of even what modeling is, right? So I can take, you know, these basic primitives um, and, and just by selecting both of them at the same time, I can do things like I can cut out new shapes and then it creates a new shape, right? So this is, this is kind of the basics of 3D. The other really cool feature that I noticed in here was um, it's got these, you know, um, these almost puzzles. So I can look at this skeleton and I can start piecing this together and it's actually in order and I can actually just piece this whole thing together to create like a skeleton. Um, and it's a really fun and easy, easy app to use. And the other cool one that I love, and this is more organic. And so when you think of 3D modeling, it's, you know, it can be this building block sort of technique or we've got the other one, which is like a, a like, you know, if you think of a piece of clay and you want to sculpt from that. So this is um, another web based app. It's free. You can just like go to this URL up here and I'll provide all this information in, the P in a PDF um, that you can download. But, you, you know, you've got a shape like this. You can come through and just actually start sculpting on this piece straight away and just start creating forms and shapes. You've got different tools up here that you're able to to actually you know, start modifying and, and really it is like sculpting a piece of clay um, and it's, a, it's very easy to use and you can just, you know, like, yeah, like I said, just go through and experiment with, with this, this program and mm. uh, it, it's a good, good indication of what some of the 3D uh, modeling programs are like. Um, you've got different, so you've got different menus here, but it, you know, you don't, you don't want to get too caught up in that. You just really want us to start having a bit of fun in modeling. Cool. So next I'm going to jump across into uh, Maya. So Maya is, like I said before, is, is one of the high-end programs that's used in all the big sort of Hollywood blockbuster movies. I mean, this is um, sort of mainstream. And I just want to kind of go through and show you um, quickly what these menus are up the top. Now, when we look at these menus up here, these are think of these as pretty much a department within you know that image that I was showing you. So you've got... Right. Things like modeling, um, you've got things like uh, rigging, that's what we talked about by adding these bone system to a model to be able to make it animate. So, you know, like I said, you'd have a team of maybe 10 or 20 people in a company just rigging all the characters and all the uh, different models. So, and then you go to things like animation. So this is a new tab for animators. Um, you've got effects. If we look at effects, just looking at this one, we've got, you know, things that are particles. So this is like water, making water droplets or water simulation. You've got um, fluids, you've got curves. So if you want to do hair and fur, and if you want to do cloth, then you've got cloth simulate. So it's a very, you know, very deep program. There's a lot of stuff that this program can actually do. Um, and you can get lost in it very easily. So you can look at each of those tabs and just go through. The one that I'm going to just work on today is this modeling and it's polygon modeling now there's a few different techniques when you first thinking about modeling um, you can do this uh, box modeling or polygon modeling or there's another one another technique called using nerves and curves i'm just going to focus on this one which is polygon modeling and it's probably the most popular in the industry and it's the probably the most easiest to learn as well so i'm just going to just quickly go into my 3D view. So the first thing that we look at is that is what is different is that we can again rotate rotate around in this 3D view. Now, if we look down here in the corner, we can see that the big difference is that we've got three axes now. We've got X, Y, and Z. So mm. you know, when we go back to this all grip or get well the graphic view, we can see that we're looking at in an X and Y. So this is you know from your side, from your top, and from the, um, from the front. Um, but when we're in a 3D view, we've got a 3D viewport that we're able to rotate around and that gives us depth. So we're able to um, scroll in and out. So to create like a basic shape, like we created before, I can come up to my top menu and I can create a cube. So this is um, the basic 
building block to anything, right? So when we dissect this cube, I just want to look at it for a second and just you know show you how it's being generated. So this cube is made up of, of, of vertices. Now these vertices are these points right here. So I'm just going through and I'm selecting all these points that are basically on every corner. Now you need at least three vertices to make up a polygon. Now a polygon is essentially this face. These, you know, one, two, three polygons, uh, you know, and there's obviously six polygons to make up this cube. Um, and then with, so you need at least, yeah, like I said, three vertices. So you can have a triangle um, polygon or a square. Um, and once you've got this sort of basic uh, shape, I can then, you know, I've got my, my uh, axes here that I can then um, move or translate my 3D cube. So I can, you know, freeform it by selecting the middle or selecting any of those axes and being able to slide it on, on, on any of those axes there. Right. Um, yeah, Festus so, in the chat was saying, how much RAM do you have in your computer right now? I've never seen a big program open so fast. Um, yeah, do you need, like, do you need, um, like, a beefy beefy computer to, to run a lot of this stuff? Yeah, I mean, you, you do. I mean, I've, I've, obviously, because I do a lot of demos um, for, for Substance and, you know, these 3D programs, you know, the, particularly Maya and the, the, the sort of the, the high-end 3D apps, you do, you need a lot of RAM, you know. Mm. Um, I'm, yeah, you do need a, a fairly decent sort of computer. I mean, I can run Maya on my uh, my MacBook Pro at home. Like, it's, it's you know, like, you, it doesn't have to be that souped up. It all it all depends on like when you're adding geometry and how how um, how dense the geometry gets and how much you know how big your scene gets. Like for basic sort of stuff and learning, you know, you can just you can just start with the building blocks, but you don't need um, a high end spec machine just to start out with. Um, but it's a good and question. some of the do, web you know, some of the web examples that you showed us as well. Like you can just open that in any browser as well. Like just as, exactly, as a way to get started. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's it's yeah, you can get started that way. So looking at our 3D cube here. So if I wanted to start like just doing some basic modeling, I can come through now and I can. There's a number of ways that I can start manipulating this cube. Um, I can come through and I can either a I can select multiple vertices and then by hitting um, R on the key on my keyboard, I can scale. So I can then move. You know my, these vertices around, and you can see that it's actually deforming the the, the polygon or the polygon mesh here. Um, or I can hit W, and then I can transform on an edge, and I can start changing that way. Um, or I can grab, say, a face. So I come up here, and I'm just selecting a face, and then I can, you know, again move it that way. So there's multiple ways that you can start, you know, actually transforming faces and edges and stuff. If I wanted to build on this block, I could select this face and there's um, multiple tools here to help me start, you know, uh, start altering the, the geometry. So I can hit extrude and what that does, it gives me this little axis that I can then pull out and it's, see how it's extended on from that initial face. Right. So now I've got a new, new sort of polygon, but you can see that I've got new faces as well. And I can actually add more faces to this section that I've created here and I've got this little um, this little uh, this little uh, GUI here that I can just add divisions to, so you can see that now I'm just I'm adding more faces. So if I wanted to, I could go through, select multiple faces, these two faces here, and again extrude. So this is this is the real basics of starting to build something. Um, I can come through. I can I can add beveled edges. So if I go back here, maybe I want to smooth my edges. I can bevel the edges to get something that looks like that. Um, and then again, you can see that it's added more faces. So the one thing that you have to remember when you start modeling in 3D is that the more polygons or these faces that you get, the, that's when the, the computer starts you know, having to do a lot of work. So I can go here and I can actually put a smooth on this. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by adding more polygons to it. So I hit smooth. And you can see that it's just increased the number of of, uh, of uh, polygons on my model. So you can see it looks smoother, but it means that the computer is doing a lot more work to to actually start figuring figuring out things out when I have to go and, and change it. Again, I can go through 
add another smooth and you can see it's getting denser and denser. The more dense it gets, the more um, the more work your computer is going to have to do. Right. And the thing is, when you first start out in modeling, you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, even though it looks nice, it's nice and smooth and, and it looks good, but you want to resist the temptation of putting smooths on your model because if I wanted to come in here, for example, and select some vertices, then I've got all this information and I've got to try and select, you know, um, you've got to, got to try and go in here and select, you know, these vertices uh, rather than one or two. Right. So you kind of leave you leave the smoothing to the end. Mm. Okay. Cool. Yeah, right. um, and I'll just also so, mention that we've got about uh, about ten minutes left uh, until our first Q and A. So if anyone in chat has any questions, and also anything that you want to be covered, kind of in this series, because you know when we have the advantage that we have a series, we can we can kind of cater things a little bit to uh, to answer them que some questions. So let us know what you want to know today um, around the three D, what you will want to learn. Um, and uh, and yeah, we'll have a chat. Yeah, great. So I just wanted to quickly show this uh, sort of walkthrough of how somebody's taken this model of a gun <clears throat> and created it in, in Maya, essentially. It's a sped up um, sort of progress of how it was created. So if we look at the model, you can see that they've, you know, um, essentially used an image that they've imported into Maya and you can see that image there in the background and this is how you would do it you know if you're working on a, in a, in a company you would get this uh, reference and then basically bring it into your 3D software uh, and then you'd start building um, the blocks to how you know the basic shapes of what this model looks like and you can see you know, this person's just used a, a sphere and a cylinder and really just modifying that geometry to get the base sort of shape and this is, this is the technique that's used. And then once you've got sort of certain geometry that are lining up, then you're welding them together. So you've got to think, you know, think about if you're an engineer and you've got certain shapes and pieces that you need to weld together to kind of get an overarching, you know, um, shape. Um, as you're going through this process, um, you're looking at creating um, details on the model, but you don't necessarily have to model everything in. So when you're doing a gun, a gun like this, you wouldn't be modeling the in, in, uh, internals of the gun because you're never ever going to see it. So really, when you're modeling something, you're only ever going to model what you're going to see in camera. So I know, for example, that this model is going to be lying flat on a desk. So on the, on the opposite side, you would never model in all the bits and pieces because that would be just adding extra detail that you're never, ever going to see. Right. Um, you can see here that they're just taking the basic geometry, welding it together uh, to get your, your shapes. And there's, there's multiple techniques for being able to do this. And, you know, this comes with just, you know, starting and starting to play around with it and experience. Um, but essentially, you're just tracing and, you know, creating these shapes through um, these building blocks. Now you can see details like the engraving on the gun. So with stuff like that, you know, I would normally uh, take um, something like that and then just use outlines either in Photoshop or in Illustrator or it could be um, even in Maya you can create lines um, and just create a mask from that. So that mask we can then take into something like Substance Painter and be able to add that etching detail back into the model. So you right. can see here that's the model sort of cleaned up. <clears throat> and you can see this person's going through and doing exactly that, right? So they're creating these, these lines of the engraving. And a lot of the times, you know, you'll not get a perfect image where you've got the full engraving, so you'll have to make a lot of it up. Um, but as long as you can kind of you know, sell the idea and, and get, you know, the basic sort of shapes, um, then you're good to go. So I'm just going to queue through this a little bit because I know we're almost running out of time. This, um, this section here, you know, goes into Substance Painter, which I'm going to cover with a, with a character that I've got. So you can see that gun being brought in. And then just scrubbing through, I'm going to just take you to the end just so you can see what the final, uh, final render looks like. So we get down here, and you can see here. This is the actual all the modeling, um, all the modeling parts that we used for this scene. So we we witnessed just the gun being modeled, but you can see all these other elements are being composed to create this final render. So if we look at the final render, we can see that that underside of the gun actually never gets shown. Um, 
And the next stage that I'm going to talk about after the modeling is the texturing. And that's where we add the wood and we add the metal and we add all the beautiful sort of surface detail to make it look realistic. Um, and for me, that's the most fun part of this whole pipeline. That's incredible. How long would it take someone to do? I mean, the answer is always how long is a piece of string? How long do you want to spend on it? But how long kind of, I guess, in a real world using air quotes kind of sense would would someone spend to create that gun or maybe that mask or maybe that candle? I guess the gun's a bit more complicated, but yeah, how long? Yeah, I mean, in, in the industry, a gun like that would, you know, would, should probably take you about, I don't know, like a day to do. Um, if depending, you know, on what your experience is, you know, you can, you know, and you've got all the, the artwork that you need to be able to like the template and all the rest of it. And like I said, again, if you're looking at that gun on camera and you're going to be, you're going to be seeing both sides of it, then you know, you're going to have to add details on the other side, but something like that, you know, some, a, a good modeling artist would be able to knock that up sort of, I reckon probably in half a day. Right. Right. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Um, and then, yeah, so we're kind of at that point. That was the gun. Did we want to go into Q and A now? Or we we must be close to that. Right? Yeah, we're close. We're like three minutes to it, so we can absolutely do it now. Do you want to do Q and A now? Yeah, I'll do Q and A now, and then we can go into um, into to, to the UVs and, and just talk about what that is. Cool. All right. Let's see. Um, so yeah, get your questions in if you have any more. Um, we'll just answer a couple of questions here. Um, so. Here's a question uh, from Johanna. With 3D software becoming more accessible and affordable, do you think we will see independent creatives creating work on par with big VFX houses? Oh, absolutely. You know, I see, you know, through some of the other work that I do outside, um, I see a lot of students, you know, doing amazing um, 3D work on, you know, and, it, and, and to be honest, <clears throat> you know, when I was working in the industry and reviewing, people that were coming for jobs, you know, I'm not necessarily looking at the, the sort of software that, they're, that they've used to create it. At the end of the day, if you can create a, a beautiful render, um, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too concerned on what software that you've used because the thing that you find with these softwares is that they might have slightly different naming, um, you know, for the different tools or menus or whatever, whatever it may be, but generally, they all do the same thing you know you're you're going to be either modeling polygons or nerves or whatever it's 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 kind of the same thing but just with different names yeah cool um and then there was a, this is a really interesting question because we i know you're really passionate about this um around like education and getting people educated i know there's some content for this uh so it's a great question to be asking um, uh, the question was, I, I can use Maya to a pretty good extent and would love the opportunity for an internship. I'm in Nigeria, Nigerian. Uh, do you have any advice on how to get into an internship program online or which companies give internships online? We're in Australia, you know, and New Zealand and everything like that. But yeah, is there any kind of global advice that you could give? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a there's a platform called the rookies, you know, dot uh, co. You should check that out. That's I mean, it's a, it's a global contest where students from all around the world, and actually not just students, it's people that are teaching themselves as well, can enter into this contest and, and be able to um, apply for internships in, in, in some of the top studios around the world. Um, there's, there's different, you know, so that's, that's one area, and I encourage you to have a look at that. I mean, if you're starting your journey on you know, getting into 3D, then it's a, it's a really great portal for, for a lot of great advice. Um, there's a lot of industry experts there. There's, um, it's only, it's only um, four people that are, are studying in it. It's not for industry pros, you know, as in coming on and, and actually you know, setting up their portfolio. It's just, it's just for the people that are trying to get in. There's other there's other resources out there. Um, there's a there's a UK based company called Access VFX, and and they offer mentorships. It's not quite an internship, but it's more online. Which if, I guess if you're from Nigeria, and you're wanting to you know get access to industry experts, then there's there's a you know Access VFX, and that they're hooked up to some of the big um, big studios as well. Excellent. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, and good good luck with that. And uh, stick around with this series because, yeah, we'll be talking talking a lot about that sort of stuff. This is all about, you know, getting into 3D. So so hang out with us. And if there's questions um, as we're going along, I'm sure you'll, you'll learn a lot. So 
Um, and also Festus is asking, and uh, I don't know how much you can answer about this because this is some of the stuff I was asking you as well uh, before the stream. Is the goal of Substance Gear to work and sync with Adobe's current stuff like Photoshop, Dimension, AI, etc., or is it standalone uh, to compete in 3D? So I don't know how much you're allowed to talk about or how much you know or anything, but no, whatever I think, you can tell no. us. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you look at substance and, you know, like it's obviously huge in games and visual effects, you know, there's there's other markets that substance is, is obviously pushing into as well, you know, and, and it's not so much pushing into, but it's other industries that are now adopting 3D. And it's like when I talk to students, I'm like, you know, don't just think of 3D as just being visual effects in games and maybe architecture visualization. You know, what's happening at the moment is that there's a massive push towards digital and, you know, programs like Substance, if you know Substance and you know some 3D program, there's going to be amazing opportunities in some of these other industries. Mm. You know, for example, like retail, you know, there's there's more, there's more um, uh, companies that are looking at e-commerce and, and digitizing their assets. You know, for example, when we look at IKEA, I don't know if you ever shop at IKEA, but when you look at their catalog, Everything in that catalog is a digital 3D model. Right. None of that is traditional photography, right? So um, there's a lot of stuff that's already happening. So think outside of just visual effects and games. Mm. Um, and just to go back to, to your question, you know, substance is, is, is definitely going to be um, integrated in things like more integration into dimension and arrow and all, you know, everything that sort of is part of the 3D and immersive division now. Um, it's really exciting, you know, when we look at the, the programs that we have and, you know, I know for a fact that there's, there's, you know, time being spent on developing other areas which are really, really exciting to me. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, there's going to be a big push in the 3D space, like at the end of the day, we want to build out a pipeline from end to end. So that, you know, that's going to include some sort of 3D modeling program and we already have Arrow, which is our augmented reality app down the other end, right? So. We've got a major chunk of it with the, the substance programs um, and dimension. So it's just really looking at these other areas and, and knowing that, you know, we're, we're working on those areas as well. Mm, fantastic. Um, excellent questions, guys. I do want to get back because I am conscious of I am conscious of time because we've got about 35 minutes left. So not to not to put fear in you, Alwyn, but yeah, because um, I know there's a lot that we want to talk about. So why don't we um, why don't we jump back across and we'll continue uh, learning from you, but if you guys, if you do have questions, you know, throw them in. We'll we'll answer them if we can. Okay, cool. Yeah, a lot to get through. I mean, it's um, even four sessions is, is not a huge <laughs> amount of time to explain a three D pipeline. Right. But um, <laughs> so the next area that I really want to touch on is a thing called UVs. Now, when you model something, um, think of UVs as a two D representation of your 3D surface. Now I've got a really cool little visual here just to help explain that. Now, this was kind of doing the, the social media circuit earlier in the year, but I found it really funny and it was probably the only people that are in 3D that actually understand this, but it, it, helped, um, it helped to actually understand what UV mapping is. So if we look at this image, we can see that, okay, think of this little Easter egg here with the wrapping on it as a, you know, think of the chocolate underneath that as a polygon mesh or a 3D model. When we look at um, UVs, it's essentially another layer that we have to create to be able to then map our textures onto, okay? So you can see here, this wrapper has been unwrapped and, and the face is positioned here because it needs to be on there, right? So um, it's a really good image just to kind of highlight exactly what a UV map is. Um, and I'm going to take you through what how how that looks on a 3D model and what we what we do with it. Now the good thing with this is that um, Substance Painter, one of the early uh, one of the latest releases, um, is able to auto generate UVs. Now in the in the industry, UVs can be a bit of a pain in the butt. You know, some people love them, other people just hate doing them. But it's a process that kind of needs to happen after you've modeled something. Um, so yeah, the cool thing, Painter now automatically uh, unwraps UVs, which is which is huge. Mm -hmm. So firstly, I just want to give a shout out to a good friend of mine who's a, a modeling artist at ILM here in Australia and Sydney, um, Paul Braddock. He's, he does some amazing work. I'm using this character that we can see in the background here just to illustrate um, some of the UV stuff and also I'm going to use him to texture. 
So let's just jump across into Maya, back into Maya. And I'm going to just, just do a new scene, not save that. And I'm going to just open, um, import in a model. And I've got my Eddie character here. So I'm just going to open this version. And, and this is our character. So it's, the, it's similar to the one that we see, we're looking at in the image. So when we just kind of dissect this character just really quickly, we can see that, you know, again, these are just basic shapes that are being welded together to give us our, mm. our full character. Um, nothing tricky going on there. And you can see that each of the sections are sort of being broken out. Now, if I just select this middle section, what I want to do here is just talk about those UVs again. So I've got like a little window here that I'm going to pull open, and it's called a UV editor. And what what it does, it shows me, I'm just going to turn that off for a second, but you can see here that our UVs for the front and back of this, uh, this um, body shape here have been laid out. So now if I select some points on here, you can see, actually I'll select them down here, you can see that it's selecting it on our model. Now these UVs, if I was to, to move them around, it's not going to change the shape of the geometry at all. Like I said, this, this is just acting as a second skin. Now this second skin allows us to be able to um, add or position things like if I wanted to add patterns or decals or whatever it may be, then it's important to have these UVs so that I can position them correctly. So um, yeah. So that's that's the whole sort of purpose. I don't want to get I don't want to over get too technical with this because it can get really complicated very quickly. But if I was to go here and maybe I could see I can see I can move that round. You can see the numbers moving on my base mesh there, but it's actually not moving the geometry. So really, it's just a template for me to be able to add details to. Now in the old days, I would take this. Um, UV, you know, map here, like, and use that as a template in Photoshop, right? So I know that if I painted some detail, like right in here, like where I've selected maybe um, up here, that if I added a crack or I added some dirt or whatever it may be in, in Photoshop here, that it would actually show up on my 3D model here. Does that make sense to you, Flynn? Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's cool. And so you so, could still move so really, and you would move you could still move the UV around and the scratch would move or the scratch would stay still. Uh, the scratch would stay you could still move like if I if I painted a scratch mm. and and we're going to talk about what texture maps are um, but if I painted um, a, you know like a scratch here and then I moved my UVs that scratch would move with it, right? So um, yeah, it's just it's really just using this as a guide to where I'm going to paint detail. Just think of it like that. It's just it's just, it's just a guide, right? So, um, you know, when you're working in the industry, you know, you you, you want to lay this out as, as as neat as possible. Because if I have you know big, if we can look at this, maybe I'll look at the the one there. So if I grab these UVs next to the one, if I pull these across, you can see what's happening on the geometry how it's warping. Now, everything has to be kind of nice and uniformed. And that's, um, and that's like critical to make sure that, you know, if I'm adding details like that one, for example, that it actually lines up and it looks um, exactly how I want it to look on my model. Mm. But um, so we've got our model here. Uh, what I want to do is be able to um, bring this now into Substance Painter. And, and show you how those same UVs are, are, um, are brought across into Substance Painter. So I'm going to just jump across here. And what I wanted to just quickly show you as well, and I don't think I have it open, um, is oh, I'm going to just show you the uh, launcher just quickly. So this is the Substance Launcher. So if you go to substance3d.com, you can download this little launcher. And what that gives you is basically all our apps. Now you can see I've got Substance Painter here. I've got it running in the background. I can just launch it. There's really cool blogs if you want to find out more information about Substance and who's using it. You know, there's even student examples in there. Really great resource to be able to tap into. You've got Substance Designer, which is more for your technical artist. 
you've got substance alchemist and if i get enough time i'm going to talk i'm going to show you a little bit of substance alchemist it's a really user friendly app very you know somebody with hardly any knowledge could actually start working in that we've got substance source which i'm going to talk about later which is our material library so um, i'm going to go through the process of actually making a material and then i'm going to show you exactly our material library and how we have thousands of these materials that you can use as a starting point and they're really sophisticated uh, built, you know, from the guys, from Substance, um, it's just amazing. And then another cool tab up here, if you're just wanting to explore with Substance, then we've got um, 3D models in here that you can actually download. Um, you need a Sketchfab account, um, and Sketchfab is a 3D viewer, but you, you can, you can um, actually download any of these models, um, and you can send it straight across into Substance Painter and start playing around with these models. So even if you're not modeling savvy, and you want to just get into texturing, it's a really great place to start. Oh, cool. So let's just pull up Substance Painter. So I've got Substance Painter open here. Now we're moving into, now if I just go back to uh, Doc, we're moving in from modeling. So we've got our models, we've laid out our UVs, we're moving into the texturing phase. So coming into texturing, you know, 3D, uh, Substance Painter um, for me is, is you know one of the most amazing texturing programs out there. Like it, not only for games and visual effects, but for a lot of other different industries as well. So I can what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right from the start of how to set up a, a, a model. So I'm just going Project New. I'm going to import in that same model that we were just looking at. And I exported that. So there's a number of options when you're working in a 3D program to export out your file. So uh, the one, the preferred one for Substance Painter is OBJ or FBX. So I'm going to bring in this um, that OBJ. For ob object. Yeah, I think so. Actually, I don't even know what that stands for. <laughs> you, you can do some homework while looking. I, I haven't said anything for ten minutes, and my and that's my first question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Good it's, job, uh, mate. It's something straight away. Yeah. So you can see that I've got my OBJ loaded up here. Um, I'm I'm sort of working out my uh, document resolution. So when we when we talk about um, when we talk about textures, and I'm going to just touch on that briefly as well. Um, we're at this sort of point here. So what is a texture map? A texture is a, it's, it's, it's essentially a 2D image that is applied to um, polygon faces or a 3D model. So think right. of it like a 2D image, right? And these maps, well, they're sometimes called texture maps or textures. These texture maps comprise of, you know, you know a base color, um, then there'll be another, light, another map which is really, um, defining how shiny a surface may be. So maybe it's really shiny, maybe it's really dull. You've got another texture map that's uh, defining, is it metallic or is it not? Is it, uh, you know, and then there's other maps which are saying, hey, let's add bump detail. So that's just, add, you can see here, this all this little, the pore on this image behind us, this, all this little detail has been, is, is bump detail. And then you've got the bigger stuff which has been sculpted in like that program that we looked on the web where you can just sculpt these sort of details into your model, right? Right. Um, so that the texture maps, but just think of them as a 2D image and you can, you know, take it into Photoshop um, and I'll show you what that looks like in, in uh, Substance Painter. So as, we're as you do, bring R RB and uh, Natasha in chat uh, confirming, yes, OBJ is object. So there we go. We learned together here on Adobe Live. Thank you very much. Thanks, chat. Um, Next question is, what's FBX stand for? That's the other <laughs> format. I don't even know that. But you can see here we're defining our resolution. So think of this as if you're opening a, a, an image in Photoshop and you're going, okay, I want it to be uh, 1080 by 9, 920, whatever it is. You can, you know, this is me defining the resolution. I want it to be 2K. Think of it like the higher the resolution, the more detail you're going to be able to see. So for, for films, we generally keep it at around two, 4K. Um, for something like games, you would sort of hover around 2K. Um, and you can see here, I've got my auto unwrap. Now, if I hadn't created UVs for my character, I can just flag that and it will automatically go through the process of generating some UVs for me. So I'm not gonna change anything else. I'm just gonna hit OK. And it's gonna bring in my model. And you can see here that I've got my 3D viewport, which is the same as what we were sort of looking at in Maya. And then on, 
my right, we've got like the 2D UVs that we're looking at. So I'm just right. going to select that chest, and you can see there, this is exactly the chest area that we were looking at. Now, when I was talking about texture map, think of this as this being a texture map. So I can come on here and I can draw on here and you can see that it's going on to my 3D model at the same time. What essentially happens when you've, I've finished texturing this character, all I'm doing is exporting out these 2D maps, right? So the 2D maps are what is, you know, essentially what we're bringing into, um, um, back into Maya to be able to add, you know, add back onto our 3D model to do our final render. Um, and so if I take it back to our image, you can see that once I've textured, um, when I get to that rendering stage, you know, I'm just basically connecting things up so that it will work in the rendering. Awesome. So, so we can see our model here. I've got different options up here, so I can look only in 3D or in 3D split, 2D split. Now I've got hotkeys for that, and that's you know using um, the F1, F2, F3 hotkeys on my keyboard, um, so I can do that. And then once I'm in my 3D view here, you can see that <clears throat> if I just work around the interface of Substance, Substance, I like to say, is Photoshop for 3D. You know, we look at our layer stack, all, all I'm doing is creating new layers. I can create masks between those layers and just blend between them. The blend modes are essentially almost exactly the same as what you find in Photoshop. So you shouldn't be scared off going, oh, you know, I don't understand. Actually, you'll understand it very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, a good place to learn Substance is Substance Academy. Uh, and it's, 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 it's got fantastic tutorials there from absolute beginners through to the more advanced. Um, I always recommend people to, to go on there and do some of the basics. There's, you know, there's, Wes does an amazing job of being able to describe um, how to, to learn substance, and it's a very, very, very good resource. So if we have a look around substance, I, like I said, I'm just creating layers. Um, I can create folders that I can drop those layers into exactly, again, exactly the same as in Photoshop. Um, I can come through, um, I've got, you know, different um, options or filters and, and that sort of stuff. So very similar to Photoshop. So what I want to do here is I'm going to go remove that layer. <clears throat> and we're going to look at our character. Now, I'm just going to make sure that's in the right view, perspective, yeah, orthographic. So what I want to do here is just uh, the first thing that you do when you bring a model into Substance Painter is that you have to <clears throat> bake what they call mesh maps. Now, this is just a push the button and it'll magically happen for you. So um, what I will say is that these maps are very important to be able to, um, well, they're very important when you're using some of these smart materials. So what it does, it goes through, it looks at the geometry, it looks at the curves, it looks at spacing, it looks at how deep the or how thick the geometry is, and it creates these what I call utility maps. And these utility maps will become more apparent as I start texturing this guy. But the first thing that you do is you just go into the side menu up here and you go into mesh maps and you go bake maps. Um, and it comes up with this little UI. I change my output size. And this is, again, just dictating what size those maps need to be. And I again, I'll hit 2K. I'm not going to change anything here. I'm just going to keep it all the same, and I'm going to go bake all texture sets. And you can see in the viewport how it's running through. It's calculating each section of the geometry, and it's, right. it's actually creating these maps for me. Um, and they're called ambient occlusion, curvature, thickness, you know, exactly what I was saying before. It's just working out how thick it is, but it's, it's being visually represented in a map. Um, so it goes through this process, and it'll populate this area down here uh, once it's gone through that. Um, and like I said, these are very important for other menus down here. So we've got our smart masks, we've got smart materials, and they get utilized in these smart masks. Mm. So we're almost all the way through here. Now these, by default, Substance Painter uh, ships with these materials. And like I was showing you before, if we go back into uh, sorry, into our browser window up here, which is 
Now I'm getting confused. Where's my browser? <laughs> there's a lot of Windows. There's a lot going yeah, on yeah, on your computer Windows. today. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to close that down, close that down. Um, and then if I go into Substance Source, which is our web-based app, you can see here that this is our material library. And it's what I love about the, the webs um, is that it's actually uh, been, they have collected collections. So maybe you're working in architectural visualization or you're doing interior design or, uh, you know, furniture, so you can click in here and it's, these are collections that have been um, of materials that have been crafted for your particular industry. Now the guys, the, the team at Substance have worked with industry professionals to make sure that these materials are exactly, you know, have got the right specifications. You can see the t sorts of details wow. that we're getting in their materials and it's incredible. Like honestly, I come in here you know, pretty much every day just to check out the, the beautiful materials that are created by the team. So you can change things like the stitching direction, you can change how shiny the surface is. You know, here's a few variations of just that one material. Wow. Um, so you have access to, to thousands of materials. So if we go back up to some new new materials here, and you've got really sophisticated ones as well. So um, if we look at something like this stylized wood, you can see again that you know, this is more for your mobile games um, type industry where it's very stylized. But um, yeah, it, it's very, very cool stuff. So if oh, I jump incredible. back so you can So you can add those materials to like any of these 3D like maps, like any of, any of the UV layers, like any of the, like if you wanted a particularly shiny robot or if you wanted a more rusted kind of robot, it probably exists already in these libraries. Someone's, exactly. Someone's created it, like crafted someone's it. Someone's already created you. it, right? Yeah. So you can wow. just, you know, for example, I can just drag and drop this leather material um, onto my onto my uh, geometry here, and you can see if I just go back and do the three D two D split, I can then just play with this transformer to kind of get the size that I want. Wow. I can either do it through that way, or I can do, you know, enter in numerical values into the transform area here. But it's it's you know, and then I can go through. If I just uh, zoom into my character to the chest here, I'm going to isolate that chest just so that we've just got it there. So things like now I can go through and actually change um, the stitch. So maybe I want square rather than diamond. So it's, it's, it's as easy as that, wow. right? So I can really just go through and just go define exactly what my look needs to be. I can come through, I can change um, things like the, the stitching amount so you know maybe i want fewer stitches or more stitches whatever it is i can i've got that level of detail that i can sort of um start tweaking this stuff if i want to change the color uh it's just yeah you've got a lot of options to be able to tweak these individual materials so if i get rid of the leather what i want to do is, is actually just take um, the viewers through what it means to create like a, a base material so I'm going to create um, a layer here, and when I create this layer, you can see what it does for me. Think of this as if I'm creating a fill layer in in Photoshop. I've got a, a layer, and I've just you know flood filled it with a color. And you can see this color is is kind of this gray color. I can make it any color I want. Um, so maybe I want to make it sort of a, a yellowy color. I can bring it to something like that. I might just bring it down a bit. And, you know, I can then also on the same layer, I can actually control how shiny. So if we're looking at our viewport, so I'm just rotating, I'm holding down shift, right mouse button, clicking, and I can rotate my lights around my 3D model there. And you can see the light, the specular highlight rolling across my surface. And you can see it's doing the same in the 2D here as well. Um, but what I can do is I can also change, okay, do I want this to be shiny, really shiny? So it's reflecting my lights almost. You can see that the the uh, the actual outline of what's being reflected in my surface, or I can make it dull. I can just dial that all the way back. That you know, there's hardly any shine to it whatsoever. Um, or I could make it metallic. So maybe I want to make it fully metallic. So you can see now it's looking more like a, a gold metal. Again, I can change my you know the the how shiny it is to get the, you know, exactly the look that I'm looking for. So I can get it to something like that. Maybe I want to just 
make it a more of a silver color and again I maybe I'm just going to dial that roughness down a little bit so now I'm going to do another layer on top of that so I'm going to try and get like some sort of painted metal look and we're going to do some wear on top of it as well so I'm going to create another layer and this one's going to be my paint layer so maybe I'll make this one the yellow get something like this and again I'm gonna it's not metal so I'm gonna keep it black and then the shininess I'm gonna just dial the shiny right down now the cool thing with this is now this is where our, those mesh maps that I was talking about or that we baked at the start come into play because we have like things like down here we've got um, our menu which is smart mask so this is going to change our menu down here and you can see all these pre-made masks for us so mm. back in the old days I'd spend hours trying to hand paint this sort of detail into a mask so now I can quickly go through and maybe I want to grab something like a um, if there's a rust I can just do a quick search for something like that and just do a cavity rust I can just drag that straight onto that top layer now and it's going to generate that mask for me and you can see right. my 2d view of how that mask is reacting to my surface so it's blending between those two layers now i can isolate my mask by hitting alt and left mouse button clicking and this is this is the mask that it's created right so you know maybe i don't you know i can i can use any mask i want there um, but what i want to do is just actually go back to my material uh, by hitting m and I can click on that mask and I can see it's got another little option for me down here. So this is like my mask editor. So maybe I'm not happy with um, things like, you know, how much edge wear is showing through here. Maybe I want to invert it so that the edge being worn is actually on the outside and, and, and just invert that whole thing. So you can see now I'm starting to get a little bit of that edge wear. Now I can increase that just by using this slider. So again, it's that those mesh maps that are coming into play. And if I have, if I just scroll down here a little bit, you can see these are our mesh maps being used in this mask editor. So we've got curvature, um, and I can just have a look at what my curvature is here. So I can actually access that from this little menu at the top. I can hit curvature, and you can see here where it's slightly lighter, this is what's being used. So it's just, you know, it's that same curvature map is now now being used in this uh, uh, mask so I can play around I can get the desired look that I want maybe I want to you know and decrease the curvature being affected in that mask I can dial that back down so I've got lots of scope here again you can see thickness I can you know crank that up or bring it back down whatever I want to wow. do so I'm really I'm and I'm not hand painting anything at this stage so if I'm working you know for an advertising company or you know in the industry and I get feedback going hey you know what Al, when there's too much edge wear on that then it's as simple as coming back here and going cool no worries I can just dial all that back mm -hmm. and I haven't I'm not having to go and hand paint all this back or hand paint my mask so extremely efficient so I can come through and you know now I've got something like that now I can just group these guys so you can see I've got my two layers I can actually just add a folder so I've got my little option up here. I can select those two layers. I can drop that into my folder and just call this, you know, uh, painted metal. Now, once I've got that, I can also use a mask on top of that if I've got more layers on top as well. So the same principles as you have in Photoshop. Um, if I unhide my object now or my character, you can see I've got this sort of base worn metal look. The cool thing with this is once I've created a group, I can actually right click on this and I can say, hey, you know what, I love this base metal. I just want to put it across everything. So I can come down here and just go instance across texture sets and I can select um, the ones that I want it to go across. I'm going to just deselect my eyes, which I know is 13 and 23, and I can hit OK. And you can see, hopefully that will come up, you can see it loading down the bottom here. It's going to actually push all these uh, textures across to my oh, wow. character. You just like apply, now, the cool apply thing, to all kind of thing. Apply to all, yeah, exactly. So the cool thing with that is if ever I need to, again, I get feedback from my supervisor saying, hey, Alan, we, we hate the yellow color, we want to make it pink. I can just come in here and it, it changes everything. So it's kind of like a master version of it, which is really, really cool. 
Um, and yeah, the other chat, thing is chat, I can... Chat saying like Man Mandalorian vibes. Um, absolutely. It looks like Bumble yeah. Bumblebee a little bit, like with that with that rust, that Bumblebee yellow color. Um, yeah, it's it's incredible. One of the things that's re been really striking for me um, for this last kind of 10 minutes that you've been um, showing us the textures is how many similarities there are to Photoshop. Like masks are masks. They do what you expect them to do. Um, like adding, this, adding the surface, layers work in the same way. And as you were saying at the beginning, like, you know, it might it might seem a bit um, like it's a whole new field and all that sort of stuff, but a lot of that terminology is very familiar for people that are used to using Photoshop. Exactly, and you know the the thing is that the, I mean when I first started using Substance, it was it's the the speed at which I was able to come up and actually do something very cool. You know, like a lot of these three D programs, a lot of you know three D paint programs are very very technical and you get lost very easily and people just give up on it and there's you know not a lot of great training material out there the great thing with substance is that like you said flynn it's like you you automatically start recognizing things going oh that's very similar to this you know and I've, I've worked with that before so people come up to speed very quickly using substance painter and they're able to get like students work that i see is incredible they're able to get you know professional quality work you know, within a, you know, within a week of being able to start playing with Substance Painter. So, um, and that's what excites people is all of a sudden they're like, oh, wow, I can just, you know, do this, do that. And all of a sudden I've got a really, really cool piece. Um, so for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to just kind of quickly go through and just add a few details on top of my surface here. I just want to, again, it's, it's similarities with Photoshop, with stencils and alphas and masks and all the rest of it. So I'm going to just quickly go through here and what I want to do is just maybe add some detail uh, onto this uh, main surface. So I'll I can just come let you know through... um, that we're, we're probably closer to six minutes than we are uh, <laughs> 10 minutes, just to let you know. Uh, we do, yeah, okay. I'll let you know where we're, no, we've got like a minute left or something. How about that? No problem. Okay, well, what I might do actually is just before I start that, I might come up to the, to the actual um, eyes and just do something here which is um, I've got like a material so if I look at my materials there's a there's an eye material you know where I, I, I downloaded this from substance um, substance source when I just typed in you know eye up here so you can see I've gone substance source when I get here I'm able to download that so I can download that and then bring that back into substance painter it's it's that easy Right, so that same eye I have here, I can just drag and drop that straight onto that geometry, or I can, you know, the other option is I can just drag it onto my, I actually, I might even just uh, undo that and then just show you how I can just drag that straight up onto my layer stack as well. So you've got the couple of options there. You can see my eye coming up at my 2D viewport. Um, the cool thing with this is that, you know, I can play with things like the scale um, and, and, you know, I've got all these parameters. If I look under advanced parameters here, you know, maybe I want to kick that up to about 80%. Um, and I'm going to bring that up to 80%. And then, you no, know, I'm Something just really creepy bringing... about it. Bright blue human eye inside this robot. Exactly. So, you know, I've got, I've got the options to be able to change those colors, right? So I can come through, maybe I want something a little bit more neutral where it's a bit more of a sort of a browny, ready color. So I can just change, uh, you know, and the cool thing is I can actually sample straight off that eye as well. So I can hit the little eye drop and I can drag that across and I can just sample straight off that. So maybe I want to, you know, even get something that's off, off the, the shelf where I can select a brown or a red, whatever. I can use that little eye dropper to be able to select something like that. Um, I can come through, you know, I can change the intensity of the veins on the side if I want them brighter. You can see that sort of popping up in our 3D. So, you know, things like this, you know, if you're creating a character, you can, you know, pretty much do something very, very quickly. Um, if I wanted to make the redness of the eyes a bit more prominent, I can do that. So, um, again, I can use this same, if I'm happy with that, I can right click on that and I'm going to um, populate that across to my other eye. So I'm just going to deselect all and I'm going to put that on that one there. So you can see now I've got my character with a couple of eyeballs in there, which like I said, is pretty creepy. Um, and, you know, 
again, adding details um, to, to our model, you know, I can keep building on this. So if I go back, you know, like I can just keep dragging these materials on top of my surface, right? So, you know, maybe I want to have an area which is just gold. So you can see now it's all on there. Again, I'm just adding a black mask. Again, I can go through and just paint where I want that gold to shine through. So it's not, everything's not fully procedural and I have got a whole, you know, ability to be able to paint whatever I want. And then the cool thing with the brushes is that you're able to import, import in all your favorite Photoshop brushes as well. So I can come through and you can see when I look at the brushes, I've got this little icon that says Photoshop. So I can import in as many Photoshop brushes that I have in my collection and, and, and know that you're able to use your favorite tools. So again, I can just come Amazing. up here. Is it incredible that uh, Carl T. Webster brushes have somehow made it into a an episode of oh, no. uh, 3D? Do you know who that is? Kyle, yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's, he's, he comes up in every single illustration stream we do. He's got the best brushes, uh, part of Adobe now. He also streams sometimes, like just before us from the US. Yeah, he's, uh, we call it um, Carl T. Webster Bingo here, the regular regular team, uh, because he, he's, he just comes up all the time because we all use his brushes. So. That's hilarious. So I've seen them yesterday. I was, I, was thinking, I was thinking to myself, I wonder who this car, uh, this Carl character is, but uh, is he? where is he from? Uh, somewhere in the US, I'm not sure exactly exactly where, but he's been making brushes for so long that he yeah he now work, works with Adobe. So yeah, right, that's cool. So yeah, I mean when we're looking at that mask, and I'm just painting this gold, and I'm just mucking around. But like, again, it's the same keyboard shortcut X, and you can see here this is the color that I'm using. If I hit X, it'll go to black. So it's the same same sort of principles uh, mm. as in Photoshop, just hitting X to mask in and mask out. So it's really uh, awesome. really intuitive. So I can come through and, and you know maybe have some of that gold um, showing through there. You know maybe I wanted to add some some details or another material, um, you know whatever it may be. So maybe I can add I don't know some camouflage or whatever it is. So I've got fabrics that I can use as well. Not everything is gold. Again, I can change the scale of that. This camouflage uh, material, I can go into advanced parameters and be able to change the the base tiling. I can change, you know, things like the colors, all those sorts of things. Um, so there's so much flexibility to be able to just, you know, have fun. And again, you're not getting caught up in technical. You're just, you know, you're just painting and just manipulating, you, you know, through layers. So yeah. a, lot, a lot of fantastic. fun. That's so, it's, it's so cool. Um, we are out of time for today. Um, thank you so much. This has been incredible. Uh, it's been a lot, a lot of, um, yeah, chat in chat just about how um, how great this has been. Everyone's looking forward to episode two, which is super cool. Um, so I just mentioned it in chat. Um, but yes, we will be back at the same time for the next three weeks. So um, join along in part two. If you're watching this uh, online, like on YouTube um, in the past, yeah, uh, it's 8.30 Sydney time um, for the next three weeks. And you can jump into Behance.net to ask questions as we're going along. We, the whole goal is to help help you guys uh, answer questions. If you have a question around 3D, I'm sure lots of other people do as well. Um, and so please do ask it, jump in the chat. Um, we had a great time. Thank you everybody in chat for your wonderful questions. There was a whole bunch that we couldn't get to, um, but Al and I will have a chat about that and then we'll uh, we'll answer some of those ones um, next week as well. So Alan, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been we fantastic. Well, thank you very much for inviting us on. I hope people got um, something out of that. And, and like Flynn said, you know, maybe you can throw the questions in Discord or, you know, we can pick out sort of the top five for the next um, the next uh, episode. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're here We're here tomorrow as well. So um, tomorrow uh, we have Bianca Beers uh, back on Adobe Live. So 9 o'clock Sydney time tomorrow. We hope you can join us. And Alan, thank you again. It's been awesome. Thank you, Flynn. Always a pleasure. See everyone. Have a great day.